Welcome to February. Welcome to this uh, forum that we've got going to talk about um, gospel traditions in North Carolina. This is kind of a sneak preview to a very special concert that we've got opening up um, the Down Home Concert se season here at Pinecone on Friday, February the 18th. The Glorifying Vine Sisters, um, uh, William Ritter and Sarah Ogletree and um, Jared Payton will be all performing at the Duke Energy Center for the Performing Arts. So we really hope that you can join us. Should sure, back up. My name is David Brower. I'm the Executive Director of Pinecone, the Piedmont Council of Traditional Music. We are a 501c3 based here in Raleigh, North Carolina, and we are uh, set up as a, a group of friends uh, founded this organization some uh, close to 40 years ago um, to present, preserve, and promote traditional music in this part of North Carolina. And we uh, currently are a resident performing arts company at the Duke Energy Center for the Performing Arts, and we're also the, uh, the local host and producer of the festival associated with IBMA's World of Bluegrass, which happens every fall in downtown Raleigh. And I would like to uh, now turn things over to our friend and our host for this afternoon's uh, conversation, uh, Sarah Bryan, who is the Executive Director of the North Carolina Folklife Institute. Sarah, thanks for joining us. Hi, thanks so much for having me and for, uh, for having the North Carolina Folklife Institute um, involved in, in this concert. Um, we are uh, a statewide nonprofit based in Durham and were founded in 1974. One of our current projects is the Carolina Gospel Project, which we're carrying out with support from the National Endowment from the Arts and some really wonderful partners, including Pinecone. And this, um, this initiative, Carolina Gospel Project, is um, intended to put a spotlight on the gospel music traditions of this region, both the roots of the traditions and how they exist today. So we all know that gospel is at the roots of a lot of, well, much of American music for the last century, R&B, rock and roll, country music, and that it's also strongly intertwined with other forms from bluegrass to hip hop to classical. And what, but what a lot of people may not realize is that the Carolinas, both North and South Carolina, are one of the real epicenters of gospel music in America. And that's as true today as it was in earlier generations. Um, several years ago, a gospel music producer named Edwin Mitchell, who I know some of you all know, told me that in his opinion, there was something about the Carolinas that it was like, in his words, God placed a veil over the Carolinas and placed the gift of music down on it. So this project is to try to help illuminate that story. And we have three really wonderful artists joining us today and they'll all be part of the February 18th concert. Um, and as David said, we're gonna chat a bit about it today. Um, I'm gonna be asking them to talk about themselves and their music because they each represent a very different facet of gospel music in the Carolinas. But, um, first, let me ask you all each just to introduce yourselves, uh, where you are, a little bit about um, your form of music, uh, what you do when you're not making music. Should we start with uh, Pastor Alice Vines? Hi, how you doing? Um, I'm the manager for the Glorified Vines Sisters, and, and I'm so happy to be here this afternoon to be a part of this uh, event that y'all that's, that's going on and uh, uh we've been singing a long time you know about 47 48 years and it's just it you know, give me great privilege to be able to be able to come and be a part of this and and one thing where we're not doing nothing i'm mostly at the church uh maybe you know out helping somebody you know help somebody can't help themselves so that's that's basically what we do we put our time into helping other people Thank you. Jared, would you like to introduce yourself next? Sure. Uh, I am Jared Payton. I am the founder and director of Jared Payton and The Voices. Um, we haven't gotten close to 47, 48 years being together yet. One day, one day. Um, but we have entered our 10th. I am 
classically trained um, tenor. I'm a graduate of Manor University. My group specializes in Negro spirituals and acapella music, as well as traditional gospel. And you will hear all that we do on February the 18th. Um, outside of music, I am a security guard <laughs> for Brosnan Security Services. So yeah, that's quite a switch up, but um, that's pretty much um, about myself. I love what I do. Um, my mother is a my mother is a classical trained soprano. She's the a voice teacher and choir director at at, at, at um, Fayetteville State University. My sister is the voice teacher at St. Augustine. So I just come from a family of musicians. My, and my father also sings. So I, just, I come from a family of musicians. So I'm just very glad and honored to be a part of this great occasion that'll be taking place on the 18th. William. Uh, hi, I'm uh, William Ritter and um, I'm the lesser half of uh, Sarah Ogletree and, and William Ritter. Um, we haven't, uh, I haven't been playing for 48 years either. Um, neither of us um, have uh, been around that long, but uh, um, we uh, have been playing together ever since we first met. We actually met in a church um, and a, a big part of what we do is, is uh, traditional, uh, I guess you say religious or, or, or gospel um, music um, up in the mountains. Uh, up, up here, I mean, that's the the main uh, outlet for music is definitely church. I mean, it's the main social outlet anyway, but, but that's that's the, the most musical place. I think the place people are most musical. So it's very much a part, a part of the tradition. And so I guess um, I'm here to represent the sort of the old string band side of, side of things and maybe a little bit of bluegrass too, but I'm happy to be here. I wanted to ask you um, each to talk a bit about how you came to this um, to this music, um, and I mean that both in terms of you know a spiritual path as well as as a musical genre. Um, I know that at least two of you are very deeply involved in other forms of music, um, but let me ask just a bit about your your teach your learning process and you know coming to gospel music. Should we go in the same order each time? Uh, Pastor Vines first and Jared and William? That's fine. Okay. Um, the way we started singing gospel was through my, my dad. My dad, you know, he was a, a, a singer and he taught all of his six girls, you know, how to sing. And I, I basically, you know, I sing uh, alto. I, I can basically sing all of it, lead all of it. You know, God had given me the gift of uh, uh, being able to be a leader, background, or whatever needed to be done. You know, I could do it. My dad taught me this, and the rest of we come together and all of us, you know, learn different parts and how to do different things. And so, um, I basically, we learned everything we learned was from my dad, and he was a singer. And my mama, she sung a little soprano, but my daddy really was the one, you know, in the family that, you know, taught us how to sing. And I love to sing. I love what I do. To God be the blur. And he had, you know, given me uh, different gifts in singing. You know, I could put things together. And I, I just I just love, you know, what I do. And my sisters, they love what they do, too. I have two beautiful, three beautiful sisters. And they can sing real good. And I love them girls. And, and we've been together a long time. And we know basically what one gonna do if you know because family is, is kind of knitted together so each one knows you know when one falls then the other gonna pick the other up so my daddy he, he taught us how to sing jared i know that you're um as as you've um touched on already your family's deeply involved in classical music yeah. as well as as other styles Yes, ma'am. Um, well, I, the thing is, I don't ever remember not singing. Um, I can tell you the beginning of my directing um, and then going into classical music. I'll try to make it as short as possible. Um, when I was 14 years old, my mother was asked to lead a song at the church, and it was a song that was quite taxing, and she wanted someone to direct. So she didn't know who she was going to get to direct for her. So she said she just wasn't going to do the song. And I told her, I said, I'll direct for you. I was 14. And she said, I, I don't know. You're, you're young. And I said, I promise you I can do it. And 
I stood before the choir that Sunday and the rest is history there. And when I got into doing some classical work with some voice teachers, I was a countertenor. A countertenor is a, a male that has the extended range. I was singing soprano with the ladies. I, and then one day I was warming up on the piano and he was like, uh, it was Dr. David Duke actually. He said, um, let's go down the scale and see where you're at. And I said, cool. So he took me down the scale and I was in the bass register. And he was like, why are you singing up here? You have all this bottom. Why are you singing at the top? So that was the introduction to me singing like I do now. So it, the rest is history. I formed the group in 2012. And my, my real reason for forming the group is, you know, I couldn't spread my wings like I wanted to in the church. See, whenever you direct the choir in the church, you can't do all that you want to do because there are restrictions. You have to go through chain of command. Just with my group, I can, you know, I can do all that I want to do <laughs> with my mm -hmm. choir type of, you know, no, don't do that. You can't do that. Uh, you know, I could just do it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's with, with it in a nutshell, without having to get too blah, blah, blah about it. That's pretty much how I came about. And William, uh, I know you said that you and Sarah met at a church. Um, did you all start playing music together immediately? What were you both already musicians? Um, yeah, right. Yeah. So Sarah already was, um, playing um you know she she grew up singing in church she was one of those little kids you know that they parade to the front that sing like the b-i-b-l-e or, or or something like that um and she was play, she was playing fiddle and um and singing since she's about five um but but me not not so much i was kind of a late bloomer um our when I was in high school, um, I was, uh, dated a girl that asked me um, to come to church with her, um, and so I did. And I'd grown up going to church. Uh, we went to a, a Methodist church in town, but um, we went to this little tiny uh, Cloudland Baptist is the name of the church, and um, it was just like the. <laughs> um, it was a really powerful experience. I mean, now I, I know that to be, um, it was the spirit. Um, but rather than these kind of, I hate this, I hate to do this to the Methodists, rather than like um, our Methodists anyway, it, they were kind of a stiff sort of, I mean, they'd have these really great musicians that would come and play, you know, um, a piece at the front. And, and it was, it, it was just really starchy, you know, it was, it was, it was, just not and then went to this little independent baptist church and they had so much emotion um and so much feeling and it was so not really like self-conscious if if you had something to share like you're supposed to share it if you had something on your heart you're supposed to share it um and they really took it seriously you know to make a joyful noise um and it didn't matter to them whether it necessarily sounded you know, they weren't overconscious about it. They just let, um, that's way I say my friend Ray Dillinger, he was, um, he went around with a, a gospel group here for 20 some years. And he said, you know, some people sing um, by notes and some people sing by ear. And he said, I sing by letter. And I was like, what do you mean by that, Ray? And he said, well, I just open up and let her rip. <laughs> and um, I was just, <laughs> I was really taken by by just the the warmth in the service and and just um you know seeing people just get up and 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 share with so much vigor and, and emotion and also that they would really encourage people to get up and and share their gifts too and I could barely play guitar to save my life and and I, I guess I could sing okay but they'd always see if I was there and they say oh will did you bring your guitar um and then they'd have me come to the front of the church and, and I'd sing something, Wayfair and Stranger or, or, or something. And, um, you know, it didn't always yeah. sound good, but the, the important thing was to mind the Lord. I remember them saying that all the time, especially if you look like you're kind of nervous, they say, just mind the Lord. <laughs> but um, that, so that's really, um, that was a big moment for me that uh, kind of changed, changed the whole trajectory of my life. I think that's what, um, one of the things that sparked my real interest in, in traditional music um, and, and Appalachian culture um, and things like that, it was kind of an aha moment for me, really. Um, and I got saved in that church 
I got baptized in a very cold mountain uh, stream up 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 uh, stream from the um, from the church. So uh, it was a really important part of, of making me who I am as a person. But but also that's where I cut my teeth doing music. I think that um, you know, especially as a folklorist, I often you know when I'm talking to somebody else about gospel music, I think I talk about it in terms of uh, music and style and history, but obviously the heart of gospel music is the spirit and the faith and the ministry of the people who are sharing that music. And I wonder if I can ask you each to talk about that in um, in your own lives as as singers, musicians, um, the role of ministry, uh, the role of faith in in the music that you make. <coughs> Pastor Vines? Yes. I I am I am a born again Christian. I have been preaching for 20 years. And you know, I've been saved for 47 years. And uh it, it's just a, a, a wonderful life. And one thing that um I like about being a Christian is I wanted to, you know, help the young people to let them know, you know, we are not perfect, but we do need Jesus. And uh, I love singing. I like all different kinds of singing. And, and, and when it comes to a religion, my mom always told me, if you listen, you always can, can find something good in a person. You know, even in the preachers, maybe they don't say every word that we want them to say. But if we listen, we can always find something good that they are saying. It'll help us you know, along our way. So, um, that's what I try to do. I try to listen to other people's and, you know, and try to live that life and love people. I, I got a lot of love. God, one thing God taught me is love and understanding and, and um, wisdom and knowledge, you know, and, and, and I love that, you know, and, and in my church, we, we are praisers. We like praising God. And in the group, my, my sisters and I, you know, we love praising God because when the praises go up, the blessings come down. That's what we always say, the blessings is over the hill. So to God be the glory, that's, that's, that's the main thing about me, you know, in, in what I do for God. And, and um, just like I said, you know, I love singing. I've been singing a long time and, and to God be the glory. I won't take up all the time. I let somebody else tell their No, no, it's great. Thank you. Please stay. Jared? Well, we have to always, um, I agree um, with Pastor wholeheartedly. We have to always keep in mind that we have to make sure that we remember why we do what we do, why, who we're singing to, and the reward that we are trying to, you know, what the reward that we're striving for in what we do. Um, me personally, I have to always remind myself that, you know, keep in mind why you're doing what you're doing, because with the type of music that I specialize in, it is like performing and some people would, would look at it as if oh there ain't no spirit in that they just up there performing no when you know what you're singing about even in the negro spirituals even in the field hollers even in the meter hymns you can find that secret place where you can release and expose yourself to god and worship him um i feel like um when you keep god first that's how your ministries will last kind of like Pastor, when she said they've been singing for 47, 48 years, that's nobody but God. You know, most people say that um, three years is the mark. They say if you're, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a joke, but they say if your ministry has not lasted past three years, it won't supposed to be. <laughs> um, so any ministry that has, that has stood the test of time through prayer and fasting and, and keeping the faith and remembering why you're doing what you're doing, that is, you know, the, the beauty the absolute beauty of it. And um, I've experienced the Holy Spirit for myself. And I know when he's in the room and I know when he's moving inside of me and it is an amazing, an, an, an amazing feeling. And whenever you put God first, it almost seems like, you know, all the other issues just don't matter anymore. You know, it, it whenever you're ministering and you hit a bum note, or when you're singing and something don't come out right or something happens with the music, but yet you're worshiping God, 
you'll look back and be like, hey, all right, whatever, we, 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 we hit a little glitch, let's keep going, and you know, so that's where I'm at with it. Um, so it's kind of an uh, interesting, uh, you know, question. I think there's a couple of, of angles I could take on that. Um, for me, as, as a part of ministry, you know, it's something that I've been thinking more and more and more and more about, um, but particularly over the past, you know, however many years, um, as, as people have become, you know, more connected uh, digitally, but less connected in so many other ways. And there's these huge rifts between um, people of different ideologies and, and um, backgrounds. And um, I, you know, I've found that, not in every case, but in a lot of situations that this music can kind of heal those rifts, I think. And, and it can be a real common denominator sometimes amongst people that think they have nothing in common. Um, and so for me, a lot of um, my ministry has tried to be uh, kind of restorative um, through the um, faith music. I, I think, um, you know, some people ha have relationships with the church that have, have been kind of hurtful um, but sometimes, you know, it, it, I think it can be healing. Um, I think some of, some of this music is really rooted in a, in a, in a beautiful way. And, and I think it can kind of heal, um, some of those schisms, but also in terms of, um, ministry, my, my wife, uh, preaches, um, uh, for her, her work, um, with the Creation Care Alliance out of Asheville. Um, just do a lot of other works. She doesn't get to preach as much as she she'd like to, but a lot of times I um, I I help her with her um, her preaching. We kind of do a a team thing, I guess, where where I help her do some music and incorporate that into her ministry to incorporate a lot of the themes and things she's talking about. Um, and I just think it really helps. I don't know to connect with people and and. Um, I'm just on a personal level, uh, singing this stuff is like ministering to yourself. I think you're ministering to your, to your soul. Um, mm -hmm. cause it's, uh, it's, it's important to be singing with, with other people, which has been hard to do over the last however many years. But I also, um, a, a lot of it is just such a, a, like a personal release, like a helpful thing to sing this music, um, kind of helps me minister to my, my own my own soul, I guess. I'm going to ask you all in any order, what is it, what is it about music that makes it such a powerful means of expressing your faith? I mean, um, I know people can, can express faith in ministry through all, all sorts of things they do in life, but music is such an enduring um, avenue for that. What What is it about that, do you think? It's just something. Um, cool. No, 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 please, please, please. I just started talking. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. I mean, it's, if you want to go on and talk, go on. I can come back, you know, I listen. No, ma'am, please. Go. I'd love to hear you, please. Yeah, Pastor Vons. <laughs> uh, but, you know, one thing I, I learned about life, you know, when we sing a song, like uh, one song we sing, there's a blessing over the hill. The hill is a hill that you cannot see. The blessing is there, but you didn't, still you cannot see it. Okay, we did another song, like, real work to Jesus come. No matter what, you know, we know that we're going to go through different things in our life, but we're still telling our inner self, we could, like he said a while ago, mostly we minister to ourselves a lot of time. Like you say, oh, I'm going through this problem, but I got to work to Jesus. God. I cannot give up. You can't give up on your dream. You're never too old to receive your blessing from God. Sometime in life, we don't get what we should read, read then, but there is no limits to what God can do for us. So when, when we sing a song, we can always minister to ourselves. And when it when we do this, it's going to help somebody else. Like, if I, if I tell you, you no, know, pray. Okay, we know every day we should pray. Like uh, the other guy said, I'm not as God in all your ways. 
and he will direct your path. So when you pray, you get up in the morning and you know, we got to have faith. You know, to pray, you have to have faith. Faith come by here and hear by the word of God. So whatever we do in life, we have to believe what we do. We can't see it. We have to believe it by faith. I don't want to get to preaching because I feel it, feel it. So, you know, keep that faith in whatever you do. It will work. You know, if, if you're doing something for God, He'll be right there for you. He'll be there for you. If, if you planning something, you got to believe believe in what you do. No, you can't see it, but you have to believe that's going to work for you. If he give you a vision, go through with it, because there's no limit to what he can do for you. I feel it on the inside, you know. When the Lord tell me to do something, I, I'm going to know he told me, you know. If somebody come and tell me, said, you know, uh, the Lord told me this, but I feel like God is so powerful. He going to let me know myself that he want me to do this. Cause there's an unction, of, like he said, the Holy Spirit, he will let you know what to do. And um, to God be the glory, and I feel it on the inside, you know, when you tell me to do it. Jared? <clears throat> Well, um, music plays an important role um, with with me when it, as it turns to my faith, because really and truly, it's all I know. Uh, I grew up on music. My my family did it. So when I grew up in the church, it was an obligation. You had to go to church. You you had to learn the way of the church. You had to, you know, there were times in my life where, you know, I, I didn't want to go. But I, I, I thank God for my family instilling that into me because now, you know, it's, but we have to also understand that the church is not the building. We, you know, are the church. So, you know, when we carry that mantle of keeping the faith, we have to make sure that our temple is spotless. That way, when God comes back for his church, see, when I was a child, when I would hear the saying, God is coming back for a church, I always thought it was my home church he was referring to. <laughs> like, we got to make sure the church is together as a whole. No, we are the church. So music has played a major role primarily because that's all I knew is what I grew up on. It's what I, that was instilled in time, I developed my own understanding of faith, my own understanding of why I was doing what I was doing. And now I'm in a place in my walk with God where, you know, faith and the size of mustard seed, that is front runner um, for me always. I have to always keep that in place. Otherwise, the things that I hold close will perish. So that is, that's my take on it. Uh, well, um, you know, music is an is an interesting thing. I think, you know, when it comes to worship, that music is so embodied in the way that other forms of of, of worship are not. And I mean, it really is like it's in your whole body. And dance, you know, is a part of that. I mean, if we kind of connect those together, um, that it 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 moves like the entirety of you. Um, you know. Uh, it's 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 difficult, um, you know, to go to a church and it's all so cerebral, you know. But there's nothing in in the body, and you know, the body's a temple. Like that needs to have part of the worship too. Um, and I I think a lot of churches have have like left that behind really, and they're paying for it now. Um, but I mean, you know, it's like when you see a baby that's just learned to walk and it like hears music for the first time. You know, they all do that, like that little, that little thing. Cause like music is so in us. It's, it's a part of that. Um, I, I think it's like one of the, you know, the closest thing to our, our soul. I think it's one of the most powerful ways to feel, feel God is, is music, whether it's, um, you know, music we create or, or music that we, we can find out in, in the world. Um, you know, the, the wilderness is a very musical place. Um, if if uh if you're paying attention to the the birds um but uh that that's for me i think it really music can can affect your whole whole body um and it it's just such an important part of of, of worship because it kind of it it can it can it can do everything um and as uh 
I don't know. I just, oh God. if the music's not there in a service, it is, it is really, it is really, really, really hard for me. <laughs> That's really hard. Let me see. I wanted to um, mention, I know there's uh, quite a few people watching. If you would like to ask questions um, of the panelists, um, you know, uh, if, if you'd like to comment, uh, we can read out your questions and um, ask the panelists to, to comment on them as well. Um, I wanted to, while, um, while y'all are thinking about that, I would like to touch back on something that Jared said. And that's about the, I don't know whether tension is, is the word or just the sort of um, contrast between um, music, gospel music as an expression of your faith and performance. Um, and also, you know, the, um, the sort of, uh, the formal aspects of performance and education. How, how do you balance those two? It's, um, oh, may I? <laughs> well, um, we have to also understand that everyone's anointing is different. The mantle that everyone carries is different. You know what I'm saying? Um, like for my fellow panelists, they may be able to usher in the Holy Spirit in the way that they know how to usher in the Holy Spirit, as well as myself. We don't always have to be the same, but there are some people in the church who are kind of closed-minded, I would say, or feel as though there's only one way to usher in the Holy Spirit. So sometimes whenever um, I stand before and I sing something as sacred as just a hymn, or I just sing something that's not, you know, you know, something that's going to have everybody going crazy. You know, people will be like, why are you saying that? You know, <laughs> I've gotten that before, you know, and sometimes it can be this hard and this, you know, sometimes it can be disheartening, but when you, when you know what you carry and you're prayerful and God has, has already put on you what you carry and how you do, you're not going to worry about it. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, if you do come a different, you have to also make sure that you pray to where you know that what you are displaying is in fact fitting for the place that you're in. You know, mm -hmm. um, my sister had to um, help me with that because there was a time when <laughs> there was a time when it, it would be a revival and, you know, the spirit would be high and then I would come with an aria, <laughs> you know, and my sister was like, Jared, eh, I wouldn't have sang that. And I'm like, why not? And, you know, she would be like, you know, know where you are <laughs> and minister accordingly, you know. So I have learned over the years how to prayerfully select what I'm going to do. You know what I'm saying? But there was a time when I didn't care. I was going there with whatever I learned with my voice teacher. That's what I sang at service. And, you know, people would eat it up. But, you know, you know, but definitely we have to make sure that we recognize that everyone's mantle is different. Everyone carries a different type of anointing. And sometimes it might not be the same way ushering in like somebody else. And I think the more we realize that, the more things will pan out. This actually relates very much to a question we've just received from Derek in the audience. Um, it says, question for all three, do you find sacred and worship singing and secular and private singing to be different practices? Do they both come from the same place for you? If not, why? Would one of you like to, to jump in on that? Well, I... I love R&B. I love, uh -huh. I love, I love secular music. Just being honest. Now, of course, a certain type of secular music isn't going to come from the same place. But me personally, and um, others might disagree, but me personally, I feel like love, God is love. And the institution between a man and woman 
a romance that is God. That's biblical, you know what I'm saying? It's not of the devil to sing about love and to sing about the beauty of romance. That's just my opinion. Um, now, if you're talking about, you know, Cardi B and all that, okay, that might be a little much, but just merely singing about loving someone, I think that's perfectly fine. And I think it can come from the same place because God said, love your spouse as if God loves the church. So why can't you reverence who you love you know you get what i'm saying okay maybe i'm maybe i'm babbling <laughs> no no that's great <clears throat> do you want me to tell you how i feel about it please okay um i feel like all gifts were given from god and everybody don't have the same gift and uh if your gift is singing you know rock and roll or blues or whatever I don't see nothing wrong with it. The Bible's tell us whatever you do, do it decently and in order. If, you, if you're singing and you're doing it decent, then, you know, I like all kinds of music. I I, I love Mick Jagger. He, he's a favorite of mine. And I don't know why I come. I just like the way he sing. And so, you know, it's not that I'm not a Christian because I like his music, but I like all kinds of music. You know, I listen to, I, I try to not judge nobody, you know, in the gift that the Lord had given them so to God be the glory if that's their, their gift you know let them use it to the glory of God you know everybody's not going to sing gospel and you have to look at this too you know everybody's singing gospel the music is not living and they're not saved so sometimes it's just a gift so that's that's what I would say um, did you want to weigh in yeah well I, I remember um, kind of early on when Sarah and I would be out um, you know, perform in places and, um, you know, sometimes we, we, you know, we don't always perform in, in church. We play at different kind of venues and, and festivals and things. Um, and, you know, it's, it's interesting. And in, I mean, in the tradition that I came up in, um, you know, outside of church and people get together and play music, we'd sing tons of, of hymns and, and old, religious pieces i mean it did, without even thinking about it i mean you just go from one to the next and and that was just a part of it um you know a lot of singing and 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 a lot of of gospel songs um and uh you know camp meeting songs and things like that um and so i remember when sarah and i were out performing and a lady came up to us afterwards and she was like oh i really like those uh gospel numbers but you you should wait till the very end and just do the gospel then and not mix them together um, in case some people don't want to hear that. <laughs> and, and I was, I was like, it just was, it was really difficult for me to wrap my head around that I wouldn't just, you know, sing them together in those circumstances. Cause that's just a, a part of it. I mean, we, we love that music. It's not reserved just for, for church. And I mean, maybe some people that would be uncomfortable for them to go, uh, you know, like from playing Soldier's Joy and and um, then just singing Just Over in the Glory Land or something right after it. But that's just, I mean, that was the, that was just what we always did. So, I mean, we still put a lot of religious music in our sets and and we don't save it till the end. <laughs> but, um, I mean, yeah, there's, there's sort of, you gotta, you know, you don't want to be disrespectful one way or the other, but, but to me, I, um, outside of church I, I mix it all together and in fact i remember a story of a my friend ray um said they went and played at a church and then at the end the the um preacher was like let's play us a little cripple creek you know <laughs> but um so i i, I don't know that there there's uh yeah I, I think there's it's kind of some hard walls put up some places but with me not um not really <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the pastor vines and jared um as, wanted to ask you what uh what william was just touching on um in you know this is an increasingly secular world in many ways and i think as society has become more divided in some ways religion has become um sort of a fault line for some people and for um 
for someone who shares gospel music as as your ministry and and one of the things you do in life do you encounter discomfort from audiences ever um you know um you know like william was saying somebody who sort of feels like a gospel song should be at a certain point in a mixed sacred and secular set um you know people who want to sort of compartmentalize them I feel like, you know, um, you, you can't put music in a, a certain place in life because, you know, gospel music, uh, rock, whatever, you know, a person sing, uh, rock and roll music, or blues, or contemporarily, whatever. Um, I think people said took religion, you know, to, you don't know, associate with certain things in life, but I don't see what's, what that's got to do with, you know, music. You know, music is what, what you believe in. And my mama always told me she listened at all. So I took it from her. She, I would listen at her sometimes. She'd be in there blasting it. She'd say, yes, I listen at what I want to. And I feel like this is a free world and we should be able to listen at, you know, any type of music that we want to, like I said, in, in the right way. If you don't want to listen at it, you don't have to. But in the process, you don't have to criticize it. You know, we don't have to judge one another in what we do. Because, you know, um, I love gospel music, but then then there's some, you know, like he said, there's some uh, rock and roll music that I've brought up on some of the old music. I still like it. But it don't make you not be a Christian because you like certain, I don't think music has got nothing you know, to do with uh, being a Christian. You know, Christian is, is uh, believing in Jesus, but all these things were put on this earth for us to enjoy. Now, this is what I'm saying. So to enjoy some good music, I don't think nothing wrong with it. I know you can't care, you know, certain kind of music in the church, and we wouldn't do that no way. But, you know, after you leave the church, you I mean, it's nothing wrong if you want, you know, listen at a, a good uh, love song. How you going to get in love if you don't listen at a good love song? But you can listen at all kinds of music in the right way. That's what I would say. And still be a Christian. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's my turn. Is it my turn? Your turn. Okay. Um, well, to pick back um off of what uh the fellow panelist said about them asking him to move the gospel songs to the end just in case someone didn't want to hear it. <laughs> um, I that's never happened to us, but there was a program in Fayetteville and they asked my choir to sing. And on this program, the sororities and the fraternities and you know all the dance crews, they were performing on this program. And right before my choir sang, the, the Kappas from FSU came and did a floor gyrate routine where they were you know, humping the floor and bringing women onto the stage and dancing on them. They sat the women in chairs and was giving them lap dances. My choir was standing behind the stage, jaw dropped, because we're like, we're getting ready to come out here and sing gospel. Um, so right before we sang, the DJ yelled out, all right, y'all, here come the gospel singers. Oh, Lord. And everybody started laughing and poking fun at us because the DJ said, oh, Lord, here come them gospel singers. And we came out on stage and we ministered. And when we got done, there were people crying and praising God. So I'm like, you know what? At first, I was getting ready to tell my choir to let's go. And a couple of my choir members actually wanted to leave. They were like, Jared, we don't need to, we don't need to minister in a place like this. This is, this is too much. There's people booty shaking and all that all over the place. And we getting ready to come in here. And I said, some, for some reason, I said, no, we got to go ahead and sing. And we went up there and we sang. And the way I believe it, people always, you know, get get fueled off of audiences getting with them. If you touch one person, if there is one person who says, you blessed me, your job is done, in my opinion. I feel like God puts you in certain positions to bless somebody. We're here to bless others. So that's that's my take on it. so yes i haven't been in a situation where they've told me move your songs but i have been in a situation where 
my choir was disrespected on a secular platform because they thought something um, other than what they were doing. And it was just, it was just, it was very, it was crazy, but God was glorified in the end. I was, I'm interested as well to ask all of you um, about your role as teachers. Um, William and Jared, I know you're both um, educators in a variety of ways and, and Pastor Vines, I'm, um, I'm guessing that you probably are as well in many ways. Um, uh, both um, teaching in general, but also just um, passing along the traditions of gospel music and other kinds of um, music and um, expression. Let's see, William, would you like to, to talk about that first, just about the kinds of teaching, um, your role in passing along to, you know, to the next generation of musicians? Oh, yeah, well, um, I've, uh, I've sure tried, <laughs> whether I've been successful or not, I don't know. Um, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's challenging to, to teach, um, or right now, I've just over the past few years, I've been trying to teach music, um, you know, over the internet and, and, um, trying to teach somebody to play the fiddle, um, through Zoom is, is like super hard. Um, I guess I'm a glutton for punishment. I don't know. Um. <laughs> But, you know, I, I do, I do think it's important that there's different ways of teaching too. You know, there's real formal education where you sit somebody down um, and you teach them the, the, you know, the, the roots of it, and then you kind of work your way up. Um, and then there's the kind of education that I received in music, which was, um, you know, not formal in any way. It was, it was just, uh, you know, people just kind of demonstrated what they were doing and, and you listened and it got inside of you. And then uh, so, somehow through through practice and perseverance um, and maybe ignorance, you know, you uh, it one day <laughs> you start um, sharing that yourself. So I, I think it's important kind of teach on multiple levels for me in music. You know, I played in band in school. Um, but I really struggled at it. I mean, I, I played like the tuba and the notes went real slow, which was good because I was um, I was just bad at reading music. You know, it just was hard for me. Sometimes I would say things to somebody like, can you just hum it? And then I, I can figure it out. You know, of course, no one ever told me that being able to play by ear was like a talent or anything. I just thought I was very, very, very bad at music. Um, and, and um, you know, I sometimes would lose my music, would go play in, in bleachers somewhere and the wind would blow your music away. And after that, I'd have to make it up. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm glad that, you know, I, I was able to kind of learn music in my own way just be because I, I think I would have gotten really discouraged with a very formal music um, kind of um, situation. Um, you know, everyone learns in their, their own way with, with me, I think it's just, you know, I like to try to get kids singing, um, cause they'll really, they'll love to do that once they're actually into it. Um, and, and maybe, you know, give them some, uh, some agency in writing their own lyrics. Um, uh, Sarah and I did that some when we were, um, helping teach, um, uh, Bible study, um, in Sunday school and, um. I don't know. Music's a music's a powerful tool, but but uh, teaching it is can be difficult. On the other hand, nowadays kids have more opportunities than they ever have in that like they can go on YouTube and they can figure out how to do all kinds of stuff that that for earlier generations, you know, they didn't have all that at their fingertips. Um, so there's there's kind of benefits, and I think um, on one hand, and then you know challenge is probably on the other just in terms of like so much of a cell phone and stuff like that it it like you know the kind of um you really get to drive the ship while you have one of those and and um and there's a lot of instant gratification stuff and music's not necessarily instant gratification there's a lot of it that takes like work to get 
to where you can do it. It takes effort for some people less than others. Um, but it, um, you know, so I think there's challenges and, and, uh, and benefits to trying to teach that, but it isn't, it is important whether you're just modeling it or whether you're actually, you know, have private lessons or, um, there's a lot of different ways to teach and it's important to try to do it on a lot of different levels. Pastor Vines, do you see yourself as having a role as an educator in, in your musical life? Oh, yes. You know, I, I taught my niece how to sing contemporary, contemporary uh, singing. And then I taught her how to, you know, I took in the studio and taught her how to carry her voice. And, and she, she's very successful in, in what she do because she don't sing like the old time in gospel, you know, like I do. She can sing, you know, contemporary really singing. It's kind of hard for her to, uh, you know, sing like me and my sister sing because she's more into this the new kind of singing now than, than uh, you know, what's going on. And uh, my sister's taught me how to carry my voice because I was the last one, you know, to come to learn how to sing. And so they taught me how to, you know, how to sing um, soprano. I can sing soprano and I can I was taught how to sing alto and I can just, you know, just catch up. If I if I have somebody singing a song, I can kind of adapt with them, you know, how to sing it. But um, I'm not a good teacher. I can I can preach it. <laughs> I'm not a good teacher when it comes to uh, different things because you have to have the patience. I don't have the patience to teach nobody, you know, how to do that. But I did work with her because she wanted to sing so hard. She, so she's about the oldest one that I've taught how to sing. And um, she's doing a good job. And I, I stick more into what I do than teaching. <laughs> I let, let um, the one that do the teaching do that because just like I said, I don't have the patience for it to teach somebody how to sing. I, I, see, they probably get out of the wrong note and I'll be ready to go. But anyway, <laughs> um, I'm going to talk how to sing. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Jared, I know that by definition, as a as a choir director, you're you're an educator, and also you come from a, a family of music education. So yeah, I'm not um I'm not particularly in the classroom, um, but I do have uh, four voice students. Um, I have one piano student, but I only teach beginning piano. <laughs> I am a voice teacher. I'm certified through Mana. Um, teaching can be hard um, because, you know, when you're teaching music constantly, it's, it's hard for you to turn around and sing yourself. Like, I stay hoarse. My voice is always gone. If, if I'm asked to sing somewhere, I have to prepare for days to get my voice back to where it needs to be in order to um, sing. Um, so that's the one disadvantage with teaching so many choirs and stuff like that, because like my musicians don't help me. Um, when I when I teach the choirs, I teach dry. When I say dry, it's just me and the choir. The band doesn't come in until I'm done. Then we put it all together and we we make it work. So it has its advantages and disadvantages. Um, I'm I'm proud of of the teaching with the voice students, but it can be taxing, <laughs> very much so. But I I love what I do and I wouldn't trade it for the world. Well, we are just a few minutes away from uh, from the end of the session here. I want to thank you all so much for um, everything that you've shared, uh, your ministry and your art, and talking about it so wonderfully. I'm really grateful to all of you, and have really enjoyed um, enjoyed this. Um, I want to ask each of you before you know before we close if there's more that you'd like to add, anything you'd like to to say in closing. Um, Pastor Vines? Yes, I have really enjoyed today. God bless y'all. I love all of you. And to God be the glory. I'm looking forward to the uh, concert that's coming up. And we're going to have a good time. And we're going to believe that everything going to be all right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jared? Thank you all for everything. I am so, so, so excited about the 18th and so is my choir. We will be there with bells on. I am excited um, about everything. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Brian, for 
thinking of me. Um, you've opened many doors for me um, in the last few years through what the Folklore Institute. So you've added, you've opened so many doors. I want to thank you personally, but thank, thank you, everyone, you. For all of your um, opportunity. And I'm excited. Thank you so much. William. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm just really grateful um, to be here. Um, and the both of you have really really blessed me today. I, I appreciate a lot of what you had to say. And, and, and um, Sarah, thank you for, for uh, what, paneling? What do they call it? <laughs> You've done a great job. <laughs> but I look forward to seeing you all on the 18th. Thank you all so much. And I'm going to turn it back over to Pinecone now. Thank you, Pinecone. Uh, and I hope, uh, hope we'll see all of you on the 18th. Thank Absolutely. You. Pastor Vines, uh -huh. Sarah, William, Jared, thank you so much for joining thank us you. today. And um, we really hope to see everybody uh, here in downtown Raleigh a uh, week from Friday. Um, don't forget, if you want tickets, you can find them. You can give us a call at 919-664-8333. There are still good seats available. Uh, when you make your plans to come down to Raleigh, please do bring uh, proof of vaccination or a negative COVID test um, and bring your masks as masks will be required inside the venue itself. But um, it's a beautiful, you've never been in the A.J. Fletcher Opera Theater. It's a gorgeous sounding room. The sound's going to be pristine. It's incredibly comfortable, very luxurious experience, and we really hope to see you there. But thank you all for being here again. It was really fascinating. We really Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.